Good evening and welcome to Southern Hills this evening. We do want to extend a special welcome to all of our guests and visitors tonight, um, as well as those of you joining us via live stream tonight. I hope everyone's had a chance to pick up one of our announcement pages tonight. There's a lot of information about the sick and shut-in and activities going on here at Southern Hills, but just a few announcements we'd like to make. Uh, Sherry Mangrum, one of our Sunshine School teachers, um, is in the hospital right now with some serious, pretty serious health issues. I know she would like to be remembered in our prayers. Also, Sharon Welburn uh, met with the oncologist today. This, they didn't get the news that they were hoping for, um, so they expect to begin treatments here very soon uh, for her, uh, for the cancer, the melanoma cancer she has. Also, Doug Smithson is now at NHC Columbia in room 1309. We also want to continue to extend our sympathy to the Post and Sowell family on the passing of Sunshine's grandfather and Sabrina's father-in-law, Cecil Sauer, Sowell. Then on the back, there's, we will be having Lazo Leaders practice this Sunday. Uh, there is a time change. We'll, we will we'll be beginning practice at 2 p.m. instead of 2.30 this Sunday. Also, uh, Tuesday evening, March 29th, is the next Ladies Dig Deep devotional. Begin at 7 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. See Dana Glasscock if you have any questions. And then also just a reminder to all of our ladies that Deet Linda Spears will be telling her story on Saturday, April the 9th from 9.30 to 11 a.m. More information about that is in the bulletin. I know it will be a very interesting and informative time for our ladies. Uh, but those are the announcements that I have for tonight. If you would, bow with me in prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, we are thankful for this time as we gather around your throne. We pray that as we open your word and study from your word, we study with open hearts. Father, be with us all as we enter this period of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Glorify thy name, number 929.
you'd like to mark an invitation song, it'll be number 771. Before we are led in prayer and have our message tonight, we'll sing On Bended Knee. Would you bow with me, please? Almighty God, wonderful, loving Father, we thank you for blessing us with this time that we can assemble to praise you, to bring our petitions and concerns before you, and to learn more about you and your Son and the word that your spirit has reserved for us. Father, we live in a tumultuous time and on the other side of the world, there's a great conflict that could potentially end up in another world war. And Father, we pray that you be in and around that conflict and bring it to a uh, speedy resolution Father, we pray for freedom, not only for Ukraine, but for other countries. We pray that the people would thirst for freedom, the same freedom that we enjoy. The freedom to assemble, the freedom to speak their minds, the freedom to congregate with other people that they share interests with, the freedom to vote. We pray for freedom. We especially pray for the freedom that we enjoy in Christ. So we pray for our own evangelism efforts, as well as all of the evangelistic efforts that that go on throughout the world, bringing the wonderful news of your son and how he can free humanity from their sin, from carrying the burden of sin, from facing the judgment for the sins that we commit. We pray they be with all of these evangelistic efforts and we pray that they bear much fruit throughout the world so that people can enjoy the spiritual freedom that we enjoy. We thank you so much for this work here at Southern Hills, this church, this family, this body that meets together. We rejoice with those that we rejoice, and in particular, we rejoice with the Richardsons, with the birth of their twins. But we also weep with those who are weeping. We're especially mindful of the Post family. And we weep with them. We earnestly plead on behalf of those that have been recently diagnosed with serious illnesses, our hearts break for them. Sherry Mangrum, we pray that you work in that situation. We pray for the significant number within this congregation that have had recent cancer diagnoses. Miss Sharon, Miss Barbara, Miss Tanya. That's three. 
in relatively short order. And as they and their families and their doctors address these, these diseases, these uh, trying and burdensome diseases, our prayer is that you intervene and that you heal them from these diseases and that you restore them to their health. We pray for those that have, are dealing with more chronic conditions. Doug Smithson is now at uh, NHC Columbia. We pray that you continue to be with them. We pray that you be with our lengthy number of people that, that, have, that are dealing with longer term illnesses and longer term disease. We pray that you especially be, in, be with and, and comfort our shut-ins. We're also mindful of the clash in worldviews that is robbing people of their love for you, offering a, another morality that is not moral at all. We pray especially for our youth that have to sort through all of these really strange ideas that are anti-Christ, anti-biblical, but have some emotional appeal. So we pray that you be with them and their parents while they try to wade through the cesspool of ideas. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the love that you have for us and that before the foundation of the world, you envisioned a plan by which you would save your creation by offering your son. We love you so much and we approach you through Jesus, amen. If you have your Bibles with you, I would encourage you to open them up to Matthew chapter 13. I like never use my computer up here for my Bible, and the time I do, it acts weird on me. So I'm gonna turn this off. There's one under here, so I, I, I grabbed it out from the podium. Uh, I will open to Matthew 13 with you as well. <clears throat> While I'm turning there, and you're turning there, um, I was gonna ask you guys if, if you've gotten into the Wordle craze. Uh, if you even know what Wordle is. Uh, Wordle is a game, and, and I've gotten into it recently. It's a game you play online, and basically what it is, is it's a game where you're trying to guess a five-letter word, okay? And you have six different chances to get there. And basically what you do is you start by just listing words. And if a letter is not in the word you're trying to guess, it will have a gray box. If it's in the word, but in the incorrect place, it will have a yellow box. And if it's in the right place, it'll be in a green box, okay? And so I just say that to say this, like what you're doing as you're playing this game is you're trying to figure out what this word is and you're, you're rearranging words. And there have been times, I'm telling you, where like I've known every single letter in the word. I just don't know their order. Or I just know a couple of the order. And so like, I'm sitting there thinking, like I'm looking at it and it's right in front of me. And I just can't, for whatever reason, arrange it in my mind the correct way. And then eventually when I find out what the word is or eventually guess, it's like, how did I not see that? Like it was right there and it's, it could be kind of a frustrating thing. Um, I don't know if that's a great example, but I say that to say this. When Jesus in Matthew chapter 13 was asked, why he spoke in parables. He said this, Matthew 13, we'll start in verse 13. This is why I speak to them in parables. 
Because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear. In their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. So Jesus is saying essentially this, the reason he spoke the way he did is because what is a reality with man is that there will be times where we could hear something that should be somewhat obvious But if we don't want to understand it, then we won't. And one of the things I've thought about just recently with that is is that I've asked myself, is that possible with me? Because, you know, the reality is the people Jesus is talking about here, they think they understand. They're not the ones saying, no, my heart's hardened and I won't. They think they have great understanding. And they think they have great knowledge. But Jesus says they can't understand because of the condition of their heart. And I ask myself, how can I make sure that that's not my situation? That I could think I know it, but not know it. And I don't know that I have a great answer for you other than this. The problem with them was their heart. And when they listened to Jesus talk, they had something that they wanted to hear. And if they didn't hear that, they wouldn't listen. And I need to make sure that when I approach Scripture, when I approach the teachings of Jesus, that I do not approach it having an understanding and an idea in my head that I'm looking for. But rather, I need to approach it asking, Not God, tell me what I believe, but tell me what to believe. That I approach it and that that in prayer, and and I think takes a a sincere uh, honesty and self-evaluation and looking at self to say, when I approach this word, am I doing it to find what I already believe, to find what I want? Or am I saying, I want to learn? Am I, is my heart soft to what it teaches? And I need to make sure that when I approach the teachings of Jesus, that my heart is soft. So that when the answer is right in front of me, I'll be able to see it. My prayer for us all is that we'll be that way. That we'll be those with, with soft hearts with open minds, with open ears, and open eyes so that we could approach Scripture with honesty and sincerity so that we could understand it, not for what we want it to be, for what it actually is. If there's anyone in here tonight who is not yet a Christian, we would love to help you become one. If we can study with you tonight, we would love to do that. If we can pray for you, certainly we would be happy to. If there's anybody in here tonight who needs to be baptized, we want to give you this opportunity to come and sit on one of the front rows while we stand and sing this invitation song. Will you come? Will you come? Will you come?
Our final song this evening will be number 515, On Zion's Glorious Summit Stood, 515. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you so much for this day and all the many blessings that you have given us. Lord, please help all the sick and the shut-ins and the ones that couldn't be here. Please help them to get back to full health. Please let us take a lesson that we hear tonight and have open minds and open hearts and, and take it to heart and, and apply it to our lives. And most of all, thank you for your son dying on the cross to save us from our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. How are you doing? Great. And how are you doing? I'm doing all right. Good deal. I haven't seen you in a while. Yes, sir. Everything going well, I hope? Yes, sir.
Oh, there it is. Yeah, I'm using this. All right, let's see what we've got here. One, three, five, six, nine, ten, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty one, twenty four, twenty six, twenty nine, thirty one, thirty three, thirty four, thirty five. Okay, we are ready for Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. There are only 13 verses in this chapter. We've got 30 minutes. If I talk really, really fast, we might accidentally get through the chapter, but I have my doubts. Okay, let's pray. Father, we are thankful for this night, for the opportunity to be together to worship and praise your holy name, and for this opportunity to study your word. Bless us as we do so, that we will develop a deeper understanding and appreciation for your word and will, and that we will live according to it in our lives in such a way as first and foremost to glorify you and then to touch others' lives, hopefully, with the saving power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, through whose name we pray, amen. Okay, uh, chapter 8, verse 1, let me read just a little bit to get our thinking started, then we'll come back and get into the uh, introduction and text. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, for he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. That's the first paragraph of the chapter. But let me begin with a story. Every time I say that, it reminds me of Gerald Hill. Y'all remember Gerald Hill? Okay. Gerald would begin something he was about to say with, let me tell you a story. And you knew you were in for a long one and very often a good one. I miss that guy. We see him occasionally. Uh, we go over there. They come over here. But uh, they seem to be doing well, and we're glad of that. So in Gerald Hill fashion, let me tell you a story. When I was a student at what was then known as David Lipscomb College, uh, y'all know where that is, right? I believe it's now called Lipscomb University. Okay. I took what I think was the one and only course in journalism that the school offered at the time. It was taught by a lady by the name of Eunice Bradley. Eunice had never married. She had had a career in the United States Army, and she had retired from that, and she was on the faculty at David Lipscomb College and taught this course in journalism. I had some aspirations in the back of my mind at the time 
that I might want to get into journalism, not so much newspaper reporting as maybe radio and television work, which I did get to do a little bit of later when I moved to Abilene, Texas. But anyway, the one thing I remember about Miss Bradley's course, which you've heard before, I know, a good journalist asks a number of questions. Who, what, where, why, and how. That's almost, as I have looked at this over the last several days, that's almost what the unknown writer of Hebrews has done. He has asked several questions. Here's a chapter that is only 13 verses long. It is a chapter that has only two really main points in it. One of those points is the high priesthood of Jesus, which has been being discussed now for several chapters, actually. That's basically the part that I have just read. Then when you get to about verse 7, as marked at least in this Bible I have, we start talking not less about Jesus as our great high priest, but Jesus as our great high priest who instituted this new and better covenant. So, keeping the theme of better, which is the one word summary of Hebrews, you've got a better or great high priest, and you've got a better covenant. He will say a lot, the writer will, in the chapters that follow about why the covenant is a better covenant. He won't stop talking about the great high priest, but he will be talking about the great high priest in relation to this better covenant. So here we go. We talk about these questions. Who? Who is Jesus? Jesus is the high priest, chapter 8, verse 1. Turn this down just a little bit, guys. Who is our great high priest, according to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. The second question is where? Where is Jesus? The Bible says he is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. That's again chapter 8, verse 1. The third question is what? What is Jesus? He is our high priest, Hebrews 8, 1, or even better yet, our great high priest, chapter 5, verse 14. Then you come to the twofold question, what? What does our great high priest offer us? Verse 3 of chapter 8 says he has something to offer, and what he offers is this better covenant. And this better covenant is based on these better promises that you read of in verses 3 and 6. Now, so this is the great high priest. We'll go through this a verse at a time starting in just a moment. But right now we're doing the overview because here is the great high priest. The great high priest is bringing to being this new and better covenant. So there's the contrast between the Aaronic priest and the priesthood of Jesus and this priesthood of Jesus is a priesthood that offers gifts and sacrifices just like the Old Testament priests did, but a different kind of gifts and sacrifices. These are not gifts and sacrifices offered according to the law, according to chapter 8, verses 4 and 5. Okay, now having said all of that, let's go back to chapter 8, verse 1. This is the main point of the things we are saying. One translation has, it's the chief point, not a bit of difference. He says, all along I've been bringing you to a deeper and more complete knowledge of how everything is better under Christ than anything was under Moses. He began in chapter 1, we won't go through all of this again, but he began there by saying that Jesus is better than the angels. And everything that the writer discusses is better than it is without Jesus. And what he's writing to is, as we've said many times over, a second generation group of Jewish Christians, Christians from a Jewish background, 
who were probably already being persecuted, for whom persecution is going to become more intense, more dangerous with the burning of Rome in A.D. 64 and the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. That's the context in which all of this appears. And here's what he says. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Now right here he does not define for us exactly who this majesty is, but if you go back to chapter 1, verse 3, when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The majesty on high in chapter 1 verse 3 is the same person who is the majesty in the heavens right here, and that's God. Jesus is our great high priest. He is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. One of the things I found out as I tried to write some of this out to see if I was expressing it like it should be expressed is how much there is in here. Every verse, sentence, phrase, almost every word is filled with meaning. There is so much that this inspired writer is trying to tell these people and us so we will walk the Christian walk and live the Christian life. So here's a high priest, Jesus of Christ, who is seated. Now, what does that indicate? And I've got several verses here. We won't have time to get into them tonight very much. But the idea of Jesus being seated, you come in from your job and you walk into your house and you go to your den and you sit down in your favorite chair and you say, this day is over. I've done a day's work. It's been hard. I've really labored. And now I am seated to rest. That's kind of what we're talking about right here. Jesus is God incarnate. He lives on this earth for something like 30 or 33 years. He uh, teaches, he does all the things, performs the miracles, does all the things that he does. He is crucified. He is resurrected. He ascends back to the Father's right hand. In keeping with the prophecy, I'm convinced, of Daniel 7, 13 and 14, he ascending back to the Father's right hand takes his rightful place in that seat that is the seat of God at God's right hand. Okay, that's what it means. What it means is that this phase of his work that I've just mentioned, that phase of his work has now been completed. He's left this earth, came here to do, did what he came here to do, left this earth, went back to heaven, sat down at the Father's right hand, that phase of his work is done. But his work is not done. We've talked numbers and numbers of times about Paul's statement in Romans chapter 8, verse 34, that Jesus lives to make intercession for us. Or 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Jesus is our advocate. Brother Guy Ian Woods, who spent a lot of his life as a licensed practicing lawyer, loved to tell us in his sermons and writings of all kinds that Jesus was like a lawyer who advocates our case before the judgment bar of God. So here's Jesus still interceding, still advocating, his blood is still cleansing us from all of our sins as long as we walk in the light, 1 John 1, 7. But he is seated at the right hand of God with that phase of his work being over, but this phase continuing as he sits in this place of honor 
the greatest of all places of honor, the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. All right, verse 2. He's a minister. And in my Bible and maybe in yours, the word minister is capitalized. Minister simply means servant. Jesus is a servant, but a particular kind of servant. He's a servant of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. Now that all goes back into the Old Testament. There are all of those instructions, and we may not get this far tonight, but there are all of those instructions in the Old Testament, in Exodus and Numbers and other places, about how Moses and the people are to build the tabernacle. And when they build the tabernacle, they are built it according to the pattern, the Bible says repeatedly, that God gave Moses in the mountain, Mount Sinai. They are to build according to the pattern. We're not talking, though, in this verse about the Old Testament sanctuary and the Old Testament tabernacle. We're talking about the New Testament sanctuary and tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. It's kind of like Jesus saying in Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock, I will build my church, literally the church of me. Or 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, the house of God, the church of the living God, which is the pillar and ground of the truth. Jesus is a minister. In Mark chapter 10 at verse 45, the Lord said that the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister or to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Okay, Jesus is a servant then. He's a servant of the tabernacle and the sanctuary. Now go to verse 3. For every high priest, now that's the priest under the old law. He's comparing the Old Testament and New Testament priests. Every high priest is appointed appointed by God from the tribe of Levi, from the family of Aaron, to offer both gifts and sacrifices. I consult about basically four commentaries that I trust and a few others from time to time, and most of them say that it's hard to distinguish what's the difference between a gift and a sacrifice. I think there is some. A gift is something offered to God. A sacrifice is also something offered to God on behalf of mankind. Okay, you've got gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, watch those conclusions. Paul loves this term and this fellow does too. Therefore, it is necessary, it is required that this one, this great high priest, Hebrews 5.14, this one also has something to offer. What could that be? Himself. Jesus came to offer himself for the sins of the world. No wonder John the Baptist could say, Behold the Lamb God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1, and 35. Okay. So, every high priest offers gifts and sacrifices, therefore it's necessary that this one also have something to offer. 4, verse 4 says, if he were on earth. Now, the word for, and I think I've said this before, I didn't realize this until just relatively recently. It's amazing how many times the little word for appears in the New Testament. And almost always, it appears for pretty much the same reason, therefore appears, not exactly, but it's a connection. Here's what he said, now he says four, then he says something else, and the two things are connected by the four. 
Okay, so for if he were on earth, he would not be a priest. Why not? Since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, the law there being the law of Moses, he would not be of the right tribe. He was a tribe of Judah, not a tribe of Levi. So there are still present priests who offer gifts according to the law. But Jesus, those men serve only as a copy. The word is type or pattern. And shadow of the heavenly things, the things of heaven themselves, as Moses was, now watch this, divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. Now watch what Moses was told. For God said to Moses, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. I went back and looked up every time this verse was used. I think it was used roughly, didn't count them actually, but used roughly about half a dozen times. There was a pattern that was to guide the builder as he built the tabernacle. We call them blueprints, right? In 19... 71, we moved to Henderson, Tennessee, so I could teach at Freed Harlan. We lived in a rented house and decided we liked it there, so we were going to stay, so we bought a lot, and we uh, built a house. Built a brand new house, get this. Built a brand new house, and it wasn't a mansion, but built a brand new house for $20,000. And the guy who was going to build the house said, I need some kind of blueprint. Linda drew him a blueprint for our house on the inside of a shoebox top. That was our blueprint. And the guy went by that and built our house. Okay. But the point is, God has given Moses a pattern. That pattern shown on the mountain is the pattern by which all of these things were to be built. All of these things were to be be done. I don't know whether you've heard the term or not, and I don't want to spend too much time on this one, but uh, those of us who believe, I don't know that all of you do, but I suspect that many of you do. Those of us who believe that there is a pattern in the New Testament for New Testament Christianity, for the church, for church government, for the plan of salvation, etc., etc., etc. We believe that that pattern is found in the Bible, the Word of God. And that's in part at least why God gave it to us. So when somebody and it's usually our brethren, by the way, when somebody puts us down for believing in pattern theology, he doesn't realize it, but I'm taking that as a compliment. Yeah. We're going by the pattern. We are to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all time delivered to the saints. Jude 3. All right, so here we go. But now, verse 6, but now is another one of those devices Bible writers use to say, this is what was, and but now this is what is. But now he, Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. All right, this may be as far as we'll get. He's obtained a more excellent ministry. He is the mediator. What is a mediator? It's used several times right here in the book of Hebrews. It's used in other places. 1 Timothy 2, 5, there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. All right. 
A mediator, by simplest definition, is a go-between. You see this a lot, or you used to. I don't see it nearly as much now. In when, when the union decided to go on strike, and management didn't want that to happen, and the union wanted more money and better working conditions, and management says, we're giving you all we're going to give you. Neither side budges until finally somebody like the President of the United States appoints somebody who steps in to mediate between labor and management. He's got to get them to deal with their differences and disagreements and come together so we can make more cars or whatever it is we're doing. We've used the word, maybe not so much in this class as in the, uh, the Romans class on Sunday morning, but we keep bumping into the word reconciliation. And I've illustrated reconciliation always with the same illustration. It's a matter of two people divorce or separate. They separate, we hear they're going to divorce. We hear that they don't divorce after all, that they become reconciled. Here is this one, and here is that one, and they're terribly in disagreement, and here comes the mediator, who in this case is the Son of God himself, and he reaches out to both sides and brings them back together through the gospel of Christ. He is the mediator of a better covenant. Now, like I just said a while ago, the word better just keeps popping up all through Hebrews. Everything is better under Christ than anything was under Moses. And that's not to knock Moses. That's not to knock the old covenant. That's just saying the better has now come. Okay. Mediator of a better covenant. Now, we've done this, but it was a long time ago, so let me do it again. Uh, a covenant is an agreement made based on certain requirements or conditions. And when this party and this party agree to do whatever it is they're going to do, they form what can be called a covenant, an agreement, with each of the two or three or ten or whatever sides contributing something to the covenant. Doesn't work that way here. Not at all. I... I uh, I mentioned one night, or one was it one day, whenever, that there are probably five covenants in the Bible. Uh, but the one that really matters to us is this one, the one we're talking about right now. And what makes this covenant unique is that God sets all the terms. As nice a person as you are, you don't have any input into the terms. Well, God, you've put five things here, and I like three of them, and two of them I just can't agree with, so I'm not going to do. Not going to work. When God says this, 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 and this are all part of the covenant, your only job, your only requirement, your only obligation is to say, okay, I agree. That's the difference between a biblical covenant and most other kinds of covenants or agreements. God sets the terms. You and I agree to obey them. But this covenant that God is establishing through Jesus, which is a better covenant was established on better promises. Now watch that. You've got a better high priest who establishes a better covenant based on better promises. Better, better, better. 
And the promise is, number one, the forgiveness of sins. Number two, fellowship with God through Christ. Number three, the hope of a life that is eternal in heaven with the redeemed of the ages. Those are the promises. All right. So you've got a better covenant, better mediator established on better promises. Now he changes paragraphs here at verse, in this Bible anyway. Not every, I checked New King James, ESV, NIV, Nestle. I checked four or five different translations. Not every one of them agrees as to where the old paragraph ends and the new paragraph begins. That's beside the point. Verse 7 is a new paragraph in this one. It's right, a new, new paragraph. If that first covenant had been faultless without fault, then no place would have been sought for a second covenant. He's been talking all along about the shortcomings of the old covenant. He's telling us that the old covenant has been replaced by the new covenant with the new high priest, which is a better covenant. So watch, and let's see if we can get this in. Because finding fault with them, that old covenant, well, okay, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the days when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. R Notice that, because you're going to run across it again in two more chapters. It's Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. 6th century B.C., is that right? You're going to run across the very same passage again as this inspired writer is emphasizing the superiority of the new covenant over the old. We'll go back and spend a little bit more time, Lord willing, next week on that prophecy and finish up this chapter and get on with it. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for everything for your son, for this new covenant, for the church, for your word, for the forgiveness of sins and the hope of life eternal. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being here.